On a lonely planet, slowly spinning its way to damnation, amid the incompetence and unpreparedness of lesser space programs, one team stands resilient against the herds, putting their lives on the line to aid those who were previously unaware of the quick save option. Yes, it's the incredible adventures of Jebediah and his crack team of Kerbinons. They are the Blunderbirds. Saving the Kerbin race, one stranded explorer at a time. Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of The Blunderbirds, this series in which I find other players' stranded kerbals and subsequently rescue them. And today we're going to be rescuing 35 kerbals from the surface of Duna, which were sadly stranded there by Reddit user Sagebrush Ocean. So that's what we're going to be doing in this video. We once again begin in the vehicle assembly building where we're currently constructing the rescue vessel. Now I was a little bit torn in terms of how I was going to be doing this mission. On the one hand I thought it might be cool to do some sort of SSTO, but then on the other hand I thought it might be cool to do something like this, which is a more conventional style rocket that does a vertical takeoff and landing on Juna and subsequently does a vertical landing back on Kerbin. And it's fairly Starship-esque in design, I was told whilst I was constructing it. I actually built this while streaming the whole process on my Discord server, a link to which is in the description if you'd like to join that. I think I might do this more often going forward, it was quite good fun. I built the craft whilst I, the footage you'll see me seeing in front of you now, this was all presented in real time to a little live stream on my Discord server, so that's always there if you want to possibly check it out. Don't know if we're going to do more builds like it, like to a live audience, but I think it's certainly food for thought. Anyway, as you can see, the actual spaceship part of the build is pretty much done. We've got that lower nuclear engine powered transfer stage, and then above it we've got the uh, single stage lander that's going to perform our Juna ascent and descent, as well as our final Kerbin landing. It's got, it's got capacity for 37 Kerbals, I believe. I think we were rescuing 35 on the surface, but I wanted an extra seat so we could send our own Kerbal to go and plant a little Blunderbird's flag, as well as, you know, I guess debrief the Strandies and get them ready to board the rescue vessel. Rescue vessel itself has 37 seats. There's loads and loads of room. We've got a whopping one surplus seat, so I don't know, maybe that could be the, uh, the water closet seat or something. Not sure. Could be like a mini bar, mini fridge. Bring lots of snacks, lots of whiskey. Uh, the sky is the limit, really, for what that extra seat could be used for. Uh, the actual uh, launcher is pretty... Uh, there's nothing special about it. It's just the making history. Saturn V parts, just enough to get this thing boosted into low curb in orbit. The upper stage can deorbit itself. It's got some parachutes as well as a probe core so that we can recover it because uh, Sagebrush Ocean's uh, save file here is a career mode save. So if we can save him a little bit of a dollar, we will do so. And of course, recovering the entire rescue vessel rather than a single crew module saves a bit of cash as well. But we are well on our way to low curb in orbit. Now, I did mention earlier in this video that I was trying to decide between doing a more conventional rocket like what you're seeing me launch here versus an SSTO. But I thought that, you know, the most recent Blunderbirds episode was like a 38 seat SSTO to the MUN, which, you know, the MUN has fairly similar Delta V requirements to Juna. It's only slightly less than what is required for a Juna landing. And, you know, 38 seat SSTO, fairly similar to a 37 seat one. So I thought it might be better to do something a little bit different for this installment of the Blunderbirds, which was another reason why I decided to go for this uh, rocket setup. And in fact, I have done, I've done a uh, Juna SSTO Blunderbirds before. I think I sent a 20 seat Junior SSTO to rescue some Kerbals. I don't think there were 20 stranded Kerbals, but I liked having the uh, the flex of having that high capacity. And also from a realism standpoint, you know, there's lots of room for uh, things. Certainly more than one extra seat to store all the uh, leisure activities. So that, that was there's that if you want to check out the full Blunderbirds playlist, which will probably be on screen in the form of a card. There'll also be a link at the very end of this video to the full Blunderbirds playlist if you'd like to check that out. Uh, I've also done a uh, rocket, S uh, not a rocket SSTO, just a rocket style lander for Juna. Now I think about it, I've only just remembered this. Although that was a multi-launch setup, we assembled the mothership in low curb in orbit before sending it off to Juna. So this is a little bit different, and I think the design of this craft is better. I mean, that mission, the lander only had space for something like six Kerbals. This one is obviously 
a little bit more than that. So I think this is a more a better executed mission uh, in most senses of the word. So as you can see, we have detached that lower second stage. Now it's performing our circularization burn using those nuclear engines. And just as we complete that, we're then going to switch back to that second stage just to make sure that it you know, safely lands back into the ocean. Ocean's a fairly easy place to land stuff like this that doesn't have any landing gear because the ocean kind of cushions the blow of the landing really. So there go the parachutes. Then just before we touch down, I'm going to fire up that engine. I think I got a bit carried away and we ended up ascending again briefly. But as you can see, I got things back under control and we touched down no problem we recovered it saved our blunderbird e sagebrush ocean a little bit of cash but now it's time to plot our course to juna now i know it's become a bit of a meme because i say this every time i do a juna mission but i'm not gonna stop saying it because this might be somebody's first time watching a mat lamb video and so to get a juna encounter you want to launch at a point where if you were to draw a line from kerbin to the sun to juna the angle that line forms at the sun should be about 45 degrees if you're not there just go to your tracking station hit up that old time warp and just wait for such a time to you know arrive and that's how you can get a really easy junior encounter from low curb in orbit you might not get one as quickly as i just did because i've done hundreds of junior missions probably at this point so i've kind of got that uh muscle memory for want of a better word there uh but you know a bit of a playing around with the maneuver node just spinning the maneuver node maker itself around your curb in orbit to get a more optimal ejection trajectory and before long you'll be getting junior encounters in no time speaking of which here is our junior encounter here now we are a little bit far away from the planet we are going to have to do a mid-course correction burn just to sort out our inclination we could sort that out whilst in Kerbin's sphere of influence but be much more expensive than if you would just wait until we're in interplanetary space where we won't have to expend quite as much fuel to perform that inclination adjustment so don't know what past map was doing here just moving the camera around in all sorts of weird ways but luckily it seems i've now got back to the mission at hand which is creating that uh, inclination adjustment as you can see you know less than 10 meters per second 5.2 meters per second oh 5.3 i tell a lie meters per second so very very uh, small adjustment to make so let's just time warp up to there now uh, time warp for me is very fast especially for you guys actually because i've sped this footage up to be four times faster than normal rate but i've also got better time warp installed which lets you have slightly higher than normal time warp rates you can set your own custom rates uh, it's really really good and later on in this mission you'll see me activate higher than normal physics warp normally in kerbal space program the fastest physical time warp you can go is four times but in this video i'll be going as high as 16 times so i hope you enjoy that when the time comes anyway as you can see i'm just using the rcs ports on the spacecraft to fine tune our juna periapsis i want it to be as close to the atmospheric border as possible in this case i've gone for just over 46 kilometers which is uh right within the atmospheric margin uh juna's atmosphere ends at 50 kilometers i'm actually going to lower it a little bit more now i'm in juna's sphere of influence where it's a little bit easier to do very fine adjustments uh i'm not going to do the entirety of our juna capture using aero braking but i'm going to do a big bulk of it using aero braking just to save us a little bit of delta v in that new nuclear stage so first thing we're gonna do is unfold those air brakes and then we're gonna hit the atmosphere hard luckily not many temperature gauges arise and then when they do they're only filling to about half capacity because juna's atmosphere is not very thick it's very hard to succumb to the effects of overheating and as you can see we've passed through the atmosphere and our apoapsis height is a positive integer which means we are captured and uh, now it's just a case of time warping back around and performing a second aero break just to lower our periapsis to be, you know, slightly closer to low Juno orbit to make it a little bit easier to aim our lander craft at the stranded Kerbals. Luckily, they're stranded pretty much at the equator, which was very thoughtful of them. So it's going to be much easier to plot a descent course towards them than it might otherwise be if they're on some eccentric location. So yeah, we're just doing the final little crossing of the T's, dotting of the I's for our orbit, raising our periapsis to be above the atmospheric line, and then we'll just circularize at periapsis to make our orbit a little bit more circular. Makes it easier when it comes to actually plotting our descent and also when we do our rendezvous back up with the transfer stage. Once we've rescued our kerbals and there go the apoapsis and periapsis markers which means that the orbit is more or less circular so now it's time to 
start thinking about our daring descent down towards the surface. So I just time warped a bit to get make sure our Kerbals would be on the daylight side of the planet, which would be ideal, not just for viewer experience, to make the video a little bit less dark, but also makes it a bit easier to pick out landmarks and stuff when it comes to the descent, because there's no real way around this, guys. There was a lot of trial and error involved in trying to get our descent to land us right next to the Kerbals. All I can say is just create a quick save, plot a descent that you think is going to get near the target, do it, and then if you don't get near the target, reload that quick save, do things a little bit differently, maybe do a slightly less of a retrograde burn, or deploy the air brakes slightly later on in the descent, or you know, earlier on the descent, depending on whether or not you undershot or overshot the target, and eventually you'll get it. During my experimentation, I realized that on this particular descent trajectory, I had to deploy those air brakes at exactly 30 kilometers above the surface, and as you can see with that, we uh, land pretty much alongside our target. We are slightly off. I think I was like within 300 meters away from them because I could have done a slight inclination adjustment prior to atmospheric entry to make sure that we landed a little bit closer. But I think this is pretty good. I'm happy with this as our uh, final landing location. The Kerbals, you know, they've been stuck there. They can do a little bit of exercise. They can use their jetpacks to get back to the rocket. Before they can though, Matt Kerman here, uh, you know, author insert Kerbal there is uh, EVAing over to the Strandies just to make sure they're all okay. They seem they seem all right. So now we can plot our Blunderbirds flag. And will you look at the ground here? Wow, doesn't that look great? Those little sand dunes with the little ripples on the surface. This is not stock Kerbal Space Program graphics. This is part of the amazing Games Links Parallax mod, a uh, link to which is available in the description to download. Of course, that goes without saying that this is a PC only mod. Consoles probably wouldn't be able to run this mod, first of all, but also they don't support Kerbal Space Program mods, as far as my understanding goes. As you can see, I'm not going to show the entirety of the embarking process with the Kerbals because it would be we'd be here for ages, basically. I think it took me about half an hour to get these Kerbals all boarded. I was just watching a TV show on my second monitor whilst I did the uh, mind-numbingly tedious task of just EVAing the Kerbals over to the lander. But yeah, just looking at the wreckage, like, what was he even trying to do? Like, what is this, like, uh, thin cylinder covered in EVA seats? I'd love to see a picture of the actual rocket before it crashed, because I am curious. We know that there's a fairly wide plate with a vector engine on it, and we know that there's just a spindly little spike covered in seats. What was... What was the point of the- I don't- I'd like- I don't- I'm very confused. <laughs> anyway, we'll have plenty of time to ponder this on our journey back to Kerbin, but right now we need to think about getting back to the interplanetary transfer stage. So I'm just launching uh, just before the stage passes over us because we're not going to be able to ascend quite as quickly as we would be able to on something like Minmus or Mun because we've got an atmosphere in the way. So I can't start flying flat pretty much immediately. We need to go a bit vertical first to clear the thicker parts of the atmosphere uh, before we can start flattening our trajectory out to uh, increase our horizontal speed uh, and ultimately achieve orbit. Now I'm using aerospikes here which are fairly powerful for a Juner ascent. The benefit of aerospikes are the fact that they remain equally efficient both in a vacuum and in an atmosphere and you know when it comes to being in an atmosphere both lower down in an atmosphere where the pressure is higher and higher up in the atmosphere where the air pressure is lower. It's not exactly the same like right? there are differences in how efficient they are but compared to something like the Poodle engine the aerospike is pretty much equally efficient at every single altitude, including in a vacuum. Uh, and it's also beneficial because although Juno's atmosphere is fairly thin, where, you know, to the point where we could get away with using a vacuum optimized engine for our ascent and descent, uh, we are going to be landing back at Kerbin. And while this thing does have parachutes, they're not going to be enough to slow this thing down uh, against Kerbin's massive gravity. So we're going to need the aerospikes for our Kerbin landing and you know Kerbin's air pressure is much higher than Juna's at sea level so it's good to have an engine that still provides a nice amount of kick whilst in higher air pressures and here we are performing our target deceleration burn to get ourselves on our encounter uh, probably should have started that burn a little bit sooner, but it's not a big deal. I can just burn towards the target, and as you can see, those intersect nodes quickly swing around to a zero kilometer separation. Then it's just a case of coasting towards it, pointing retrograde relative to our target, then eyeballing it. As we get nice and close, we can then kill that velocity back down to zero. 
which is now done. <laughs> so we can begin to initiate the, uh, in air quotes, uh, loud, lazy method of docking in which we just get the vessels to align nice and easily using auto SAS. I'm basically selecting both vessels. This transfer stage, while unmanned, has a connection to the Kerbal Space Center and it has a probe car on board, so we can still control it. I've basically used auto SAS to have both ships automatically target each other's docking ports. All we then have to do is just coast them towards each other and as you can see even though there is some rotation there they maintain alignment and we pop together with absolutely no difficulty so now we are back in space it's time to actually first of all i'm just quickly making an action group because it was quicker to quickly make an action group to toggle all those aero spike engines at once rather than just manually disable them individually before firing up our nuclear engines for our escape burn uh, and as you can see in terms of our escape burn we're not at an optimal position to get a Kerbin encounter but rather than waste time in Juno orbit like some sort of peasant I decided to simply go ahead and execute a burn that will lower our solar periapsis to intersect Kerbin's orbit once we reach that point we can then create another maneuver node to force those intersect nodes to align to get a nice early Kerbin encounter that will happen before we reach a kind of, in air quotes, natural Kerbin transfer window. So clearly not as efficient, but it gets us home a little bit faster. And we do have the Delta V in that transfer stage to perform this without worrying about running out of fuel. Contrary to what the Delta V readout of the game says, though, uh, it says we've only got, you know, just over 500 meters per second left in that transfer stage. This is a uh, fake news, guys. Uh, in reality, although I don't know the exact figure, we had something like 2000 meters per second remaining in that transfer stage. I think the game just got confused because we've got multiple engines on this craft with multiple different fuel sources. Of course, the nuclear engines only require liquid fuel, while the aero spikes, which are also less efficient than the nuclear engines, require both liquid fuel and oxidizer. So I don't know if it was just calculating just the aero spike delta v and then it was taking into account the fact that the aero spikes are lugging that transfer stage which drains some of the theoretical delta v from the craft not sure what happened really and i didn't really know how much delta v i had left at this point so i just started continuing with the mission as i intended and hoped that i'd figured out all of the correct numbers whilst building this in the vehicle assembly building luckily i did it was fine but it was a bit of a stressful moment and i think actually as well when it comes to the game not being able to calculate the delta v having those docking ports there didn't help things either because docking ports can allow for transfer of fuel unlike decouplers well actually i say that's not completely true decouplers can permit transfer of fuel just not by default and likewise you can disable fuel cross feed in the decouplers which i did but i don't know if that just i don't know if that added fuel to the fire when it came to the game not really knowing how much delta v i had left either way it wasn't a big problem so if you do see like <laughs> with, with this bird i can see the delta v numbers uh, of the game so the delta v readout above the staging window is actually increasing as we perform this burn although now it's suddenly dropped it's fluctuating okay it's yo-yoing i don't know what really happened but you can see our true delta v readout in the top left hand corner of the screen on the kerbal engineer panel uh, where it says delta v and in brackets current total again even that's not completely accurate because we have multiple engines with multiple fuel sources that could be activated at any point. But it gives you a better idea of a, a kind of a more accurate representation of how much Delta V we had left in this spacecraft. But here we are encountering our home planet. And as we drop out of the map screen, we can see that little blue, pale blue dot in the distance. So just lining myself along our manoeuvre node and getting ready to perform our capture burn. So I'm going to do two burns at periapsis. One to perform our initial curb in capture and then we're going to do a second one just to lower our apoapsis as much as we possibly can before our fuel supply uh, runs out at which point we can you know detach that lower stage but not before we drop our periapsis to be within the atmospheric borders that it just burns up and is destroyed on re-entry rather than just being left uh, drifting aimlessly uh, through space. So now that's done, we can time warp around and get ready to perform our second burn. Now, I wasn't sure if I was going to have enough Delta V to perform the burn in its entirety. And obviously, I couldn't really rely on the maneuver node indicator or the in-game Delta V readouts on the staging window. So basically, I just right-clicked one of the fuel tanks and just watched the liquid fuel level. And I thought, just before we run out of fuel, I'll stop burning. Just that we've got a little bit of residual fuel left 
to perform our deorbit burn for that transfer stage. Of course, our lander stage has engines and fuel remaining in it, so that can uh, do the rest of the uh, burns we need to do to perform our Kerbin landing. Uh, so we are just performing our retrograde burn with the transfer stage there. Goodbye transfer stage, you've served us well. And now we come to what was probably the hardest part of this mission and that was our Kerbin landing. Now it's not like difficult by default, but I set myself the stupid goal of trying to land on the Kerbal Space Center Peninsula. Like, you know where the Kerbal Space Center is? The actual area of land around it is very flat. It's got a slightly different texture to it. I wanted that vicinity to be our land location just because I didn't I couldn't really be bothered to get this accurate enough to land on the helipad because I only have like uh, like two days in a week to make these videos and two days is not very long when I'm working for most of that day and I've got to like plan the mission build the mission execute it I didn't really have time to like faff around too much to get myself accurate enough to land on like a helipad or a launch pad or something so I thought you know just landing on the little peninsula on which the Kerbal Space Center sits would be a good enough compromise however However, this still proved to be fairly difficult. It took me a couple of attempts to get our actual uh, descent trajectory optimal, but we got it in the end, so I hope you enjoy the next few minutes of video. I believe this is something that EGSA does as well. Last time I watched one of his streams anyway, I just remember him mentioning that he always aims to land his craft, and no matter what, to always be on that little peninsula on which the Kerbal Space Center sits. And so I'll be darned if we don't at least try to do that uh, in this mission. So just performing a very slight retrograde burn, our Perapsis height is at a fairly conservative 24,000 meters above the surface, although that's now rapidly dropping as we reach the thicker parts of the atmosphere where we're going to start seeing those flames lap up the side of the booster. I have those air brakes there set to uh, kind of control the pitch and yaw of the craft, much like how the SpaceX Starship will control its descent using its body fins, although not quite the same as this. We are entering engine first in this instance rather than doing the belly flop maneuver that Starship will do, but it's, you know, at least somewhat similar in that we're using what are effectively air brakes to uh, manipulate our craft's descent. I guess it's kind of similar to a Falcon 9's descent now I think about it. I could have just used that because that's a real life example. Well, I guess the Starship is real life, but it hasn't been proven yet. Although, uh, there are now there is now news that SpaceX are aiming to do its 15 kilometer flight uh, this next week sometime. I'm trying to think when this is going to be uploaded. But yeah, next week. So in a few days for you guys. Things might have changed by then, but I am recording this on Friday the 27th and it is my intention to upload this on Saturday the 28th. So I hope that, like, no major, nothing major happens between now and then. Uh, and as you can see, we are now performing our landing burn here. Fairly easy to do. Those parachutes are helping us stay nice and upright. And here we touch down, no problem. We've got a lot of the components for the mission on this thing so we can recover it and get all of those funds back for use in a later mission. Uh, but, you know, that is the end of this mission pretty much. We can do a final little pan around shot, get a good look at this booster all recovered nicely, although it's not recovered yet. Now it is. Now we've hit the uh, recover button. There we are. We've got a little bit of science. I think I got a couple of the Kerbals to take an EVA report and a surface sample from the surface of Juna. Uh, but that's it, actually. Uh, we can just cross fade across to an end screen. On the left hand side is a panel that'll take it to the full Blunderbirds playlist. The right hand side was a video chosen for you by YouTube's recommendation algorithm based on your viewing habits. Hopefully, it made a good choice. The description you'll find links to Twitter, Discord, Instagram, merchandise, all that good stuff. Guys, thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it very much, and I hope to see you on Monday for Space This Week.